uh, directions a bit. We're going to hear a different kind of talk from an archaeologist. Um, Timothy Insall is a chair in archaeology at the University of Manchester. He received his PhD at the University of Cambridge, and he's an archaeologist who specializes in the archaeology of religions and rituals, and particularly the archaeology of Islam in Africa and African indigenous religions. He's published widely, and most recently uh, he co-authored a volume entitled Temporal Temporalizing Anthropology, Archaeology in the Talensi Tong Hills, Northern Ghana, which was published in 2013. Today he'll be talking to us about, the, about objects and power in the archaeology of sub-Saharan African Islam. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Timothy. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you've got the title there, Objects and Power in the Archaeology of Sub-Saharan African Islam. And what I'm going to do is, rather than read the text, is I'm going to work from points on the screen so you can follow it as I go along. And I think the first point to make is that the archaeology of Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa is remarkably diverse, as probably would be expected from a continent that, si that size. And I'll be dealing essentially with examples from south of the Sahara, hence the notion of Sub-Saharan Africa. And this uh, complexity and diversity operates in relation to both its ge geological or geographical and chronological frameworks as well, and also in relation to the life ways it influenced, because obviously within this vast terrain you've got both settled and nomad communities as well. And this is also reflected in how power is materialised in sub-Saharan Africa too. So today what I want to do is to explore examples. I can't pretend to be comprehensive in my coverage. If you want the comprehensive coverage, then I've got an advert here for a book that I wrote on the subject a few years ago that does present all the material in detail. So today what I want to do is to explore examples with an emphasis placed on archaeology to look at how power was constructed and legitimised through a complex of objects, substances, context, landscapes, and architecture. And I think the important point to make, it's impossible to abstract objects out of their context. So that's why I'm going to have to talk around various different themes. And then the other subject I want to consider today is how this has helped assist in fitting Islam to existing requirements and beliefs via the processes of syncretism or blending and also adaptation as well. Because it's important to make the point that it's not a hey presto process of Islamic conversion that's occurring. It's a long drawn out process that I'm going to be describing. And sometimes it's only partial, as you'll see as well, with the integration or continuation of elements from African indigenous religions as well. Now, at the south of the Sahara, what we can do is essentially we can divide the continent for our purposes into seven different regions. Sorry, am I too loud for everyone here? No, it's great. Okay. <laughs> so seven different regions. You've got here Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa over here on the right. Then you've got the eastern or Nilotic Sudan here. That thin black line down there in this big island here is essentially constitutes the East African coast. Then if we go over here, these uh, hatched lines here, this is the western Sahel. Then down here, you've got the central Sudanic region. Sudanic being a reference to the, ge the, the geography of the area, the environment of the area, not to the modern country. Then down here, you've got the West African Sudan and forest. And then finally, this checkered area here, you've got East Central and Southern Africa. Some of you will have noticed that there are blanks on the map here. Those are the only areas in my survey of sub-Saharan Africa that I could find no Islamic archaeology whatsoever. So, for example, in uh, Angola and Namibia, there's none there. Perhaps people will be able to point out my error to me today, but so far no one has done that. Now, that pattern of geographical progression essentially also follows broadly the chronology of the archaeology of Islam in sub-Saharan Africa as well. And it essentially begins on the Red Sea coast of the Sudan. So here, also the coast, the former coast of Ethiopia, now obviously the independent country of Eritrea. In parts of Somalia, you've got your earliest material as well. And also in Nubia which is the borderland between Egypt and Sudan and runs in both countries, obviously. And that's around about the earliest material you've got, dates from about the early 8th century. And I would make the point that all the dates I'm using today are AD, so I won't confuse anyone, hopefully. Then you get Islam essentially spreading to parts of the East African coast. You've got this chain of city-states 
or polities down here. This is in the late 8th to early 9th centuries or thereabouts. And then in the Western Sahel, the area that I know best, where I did some extensive excavations that I'll refer to later on, it appears in about the late 9th to early 10th centuries. And the reason for the appearance of Islam in these two regions was because of trade. So on the East African coast here, you've got archaeological evidence for small Muslim communities from about 800 AD, famous sites being Kilwa and Shanga here, uh, just about here on the map. And these were communities that participated in long-distance seaborne trade, Indian Ocean trade networks that circulated around this vast area here, stretching out as far as China, up the Red Sea, and then connecting to the areas that we've been hearing about this morning here as well. Then it's slightly later in date offshore. There's Madagascar again. The Comoros are not marked on the map. They're about here. There, Islam is slightly later in date. There's an absence of material culture for the presence of Muslims in this area until about the 10th to 11th centuries, when you begin to find the settlement of Muslim traders on the northern tip of Madagascar, and you begin to get material like these glasswares that are stored in the British Institute in East Africa. They came out of Pierre Verin's excavations at the site of Vohimar in northeastern Madagascar, and date probably from the 13th to 14th centuries. Here I've just put this in. This is a reconstruction of the palace at Kilwa to give you an idea of how substantial these entities were on the East African coast. Trade was also the mechanism for why Islamization occurred in the Western Sahel. Um, it's very much like the situation I described for the Indian Ocean, except that we can transpose the Sahara the, as the great ocean of sand instead of the ocean of water. And of course, the Sahel means coast in Arabic. So the towns on that coast were the ones that were involved in trade. These are both cities that I've excavated in. This is our excavation in Gao in Mali over here. Um, this is part of a palace or mosque that you can see that dates from about the 10th to 11th centuries, which is when about you get the first evidence for Islam in that region. And then much better known is the city of Timbuktu. If I did a hands up here, I expect most people won't heard of Gao, but everyone will have heard of Timbuktu. But actually the archaeology is a lot more disappointing at Timbuktu. This is one of our excavations next to the Sankore Mosque that you can see here. And you get the first evidence there for the presence of Muslims in about the 11th to 12th centuries AD. Remember, I'm talking from archaeological perspectives. Now, Islam is attested historically in the central Sudanic belt in the 11th century, but we only get archaeological evidence for it from the 13th century. And this is characteristic of a recurrent divergence of evidence that you find between the historical sources and the material culture, certainly as is being generated by archaeology. In part, would be related, of course, to the problems of dating. Slightly later, further to the south, this area here is this area here in this map here. You get evidence for um, possible Islamic contacts represented by trade goods and a possible Muslim presence architecturally from about the 13th to 14th centuries AD in the vast area of the Western Sudanic zone um, and in the forest here, the further forested south as well. And then finally, Islam is represented materially much later in East Central and Southern Africa. You get from about the mid 17th century material culture evidence for Muslims in the Cape region. This is one of the so called Cape Malay mosques, indicating the links between um, South Africa at that point in time and the Indonesian archipelago, which of course was a result of the Dutch connections and colonization between the two regions. And that dates from about the 17th century, but this area up here is largely from the 19th century and was linked in with the slave raiding that was going on from the, in, uh, the Indian Ocean into the interior. So it's much later in date there. Now, until the mid-1980s, Islam in Africa was largely neglected by archaeologists. Of course, it was not neglected by anthropologists, art historians, or historians. And I put a few of the covers up of some of the seminal studies that have been done by scholars from these particular disciplines. Um, the picture of archaeological neglect persisted until about the mid-1980s. There were, of course, exceptions. The work of Raymond Morny, the French archaeologist at various sites in the Western Sahel, or Neville Chittick, the British archaeologist at various sites, Swahili sites over here, provide exceptions. But since the mid-1980s, there have been various projects that have been undertaken that have attempted to look at the archaeology of Islam more holistically, 
and also with a series of goals in mind. So what we would call a social archaeological perspective, attempting to reconstruct the past lifeways of these people in relation to their diet and such like as well. Also in relation to exploring themes such as power and authority. And the main areas where this work has been done are in the Western Sahel, coastal East Africa, and in the northern Sudanic region, where there's some good work going on currently. Now, turning to the categories of evidence that give us an idea about power, landscapes of power are very significant. You get the agency of landscape appropriation, which is important in processes of both constructing and legitimating Islamic identity. So what we literally see is the Islamization of some landscapes. This is a, a classic study of this. This is the site of Esuk, which is the presumed, I can't quite see the slide from where I'm standing here, but it's about there on the map. It's in northern Mali. It's the presumed site of Tad Mecca, which was described by the Arab historian al-Bakri in the 11th century. And we know through the work of Paolo Farias, the epigraphist at the University of Birmingham, and also the uh, meticulous archaeological excavations of Sam Nixon at the Institute of Archaeology in London about the importance of landscape in this particular site. So what we got here is Farias identified on one of the rock, there's the site plan there, these are the rock outcrops surrounding the site. He identified the oldest internally dated piece of writing from West Africa from this site, which states this is the year 4 and 400, 404 AH, which he gives a date range of 13th, 7th, 1013 to 2nd of the 7th. 1014. And there are also references to Mecca repeatedly found. So, for example, and there will it remain to it a market in conformity to Becca, meaning Mecca according to Farias, and the book will remain, meaning a reference to the Quran. And this is important, as Farias suggests the synonym Becca emphasizes literally people drawing a comparison between Mecca here, here's the Mecca landscape, and Esuk Tad Mecca, the landscape here. And they're literally drawing comparisons between the topography and the valleys in a way of Islamizing landscape in this particular uh, context. So he's argued that it's a very strong identification of African and Arabian landscapes that's occurring at this important moment in time when you've got Islamization occurring there. So the sanctity of Mecca is being invoked through place and landscape in West Africa. So you could say that this equates to what we could call the power of place in this particular instance. Now the power of Muslim saints and authority figures is also made manifest through tombs in the landscape. That's another way that it's sort of Islamized and they become places of power. The Gubbas of northern Sudan, which are there many, many of them, the domed brick tombs that you can see here. And these were part of the processes by which Islam was popularized and have been discussed by, for example, McHugh and Trimingham. And this also, we have to say, relates to the creation of another layer of power in this region that is centered around holy men and Sufi orders as well. So complexity of landscape appropriation and power. And this is the focus of my current research that's just beginning actually, we did the first season last April in the city of Harar in Eastern Ethiopia, where very much saints tombs are the focal point in what has been described as this town of saints by the French anthropologist Foucher, as you can see in that quote there. And there are over 150 saints' tombs recorded. This is the Amir Nur tomb, which we hope to excavate to, we've got the grant for it now, in July and August of this year. Now, the origins of the Harar are unclear. They could be anywhere between the 10th to 16th centuries AD, and that's a surprisingly long period of time that has great implications for Islamization and the negotiation of power as well. But anyway, it's walled. You can see part of the jugal or wall that's here. It has five gates that relate to five quarters in the city. It's a beautiful city to visit. And these five quarters apparently also relate to the five pillars of Islam as well. And we want to excavate, do trial trenching within there to put this on a sound chronological footing. The Harar saints tombs also seem to be a reflection of syncretic process. And this is hinted at by, for example, the origin traditions that relate to the two populations of the Argoba and the Hala, who are partly mythical, but still have villages on the outskirts of Harar associated with large archaeological sites that we're going to be test excavating as well to try and work out the chronology. And there are also fascinating human-animal relations represented by the feeding of the hyenas. This young man's about to feed it, which is quite a brave undertaking, from his mouth, as you can see there. And those are linked in with shrines, 
in particular with this shrine here that we want to excavate next to, which is the Or Ansar shrine that you can see there. And apparently this happens every day now for tourists, obviously. It's, I, I was a tourist. I went along and took these photographs. But it's also something that links into annual festivals of feeding that are connected with the Ashura festival as well. So what we want to do is put in an archaeological aspect to look at the power of landscape in this particular context, to put it on a sound chronological footing. Now, Islamic funerary monuments are sources of power that are syncretized with older traditions are encountered elsewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, and in particular in the Horn of Africa. The uh, Muslim Afar are sometimes referred to as the Danakil, this area, the Danakil Desert. They built, as you can see here, stone tombs of various sorts. There's a plan of them there. These are Muslim tombs, but they were often finished with a line of upright stones that indicated the number of men the incumbent, usually a male, or always a male incumbent, had killed. So what you've got here is you've got the sanctity of Islam that's apparent through the tomb, but that's being linked in with earlier concepts of masculinity that were centred on the taking of trophies, in particular to cutting off the male genitals, which would be taken as a way of appropriating the power of the individual and then appropriating his power as well. So it's a sort of repeat theme that you find. And it's a continuation, essentially, of what the anthropologist of the Horn of Africa, I.M. Lewis, has referred to as a cult of the dead. And this is a cult well known in the region and continues today. It doesn't continue so much now amongst the Danakil, who attend, or the Afar are tending to follow a more orthodox variety of Islam. But further south in the Konso region, in the southwest of Ethiopia, we've also been doing work there, looking at the materiality of stone and how that links into concepts of ancestry, because it's a durable material that survives and such like. Here you can see some of these standing stones indicating the incumbent of this tomb as a killed a fair few individuals, as you can see by the sanding stones there. Now, the pillar tombs of the East African coast, we were up here before, now we're coming down here. The pillar tombs of the East African coast, the Swahili pillar tombs, that date from essentially between the 14th to 17th centuries, these also show similar processes. They're not linked to trophy taking, but they're linked to commemoration. So here you've got, for example, this coral pillar that's marking the deceased in this tomb here. And these can be up to six metres in height, often marked with a celadon dish. You've got the green celadon dish here. That would have been placed in here. Most of them have now been removed because they are attractive in the art market and also been removed to be used because they're thought to be invested with power. So these green ceramics are being ground or were being ground down and incorporated into medicines and then ingested, partly through the fact that they were thought of as old and powerful. These tombs, they had multiple purposes beyond providing just a resting place for the deceased. Essentially, they facilitated what the Zanzibari archaeologist Abdurrahman Juma has described as an active way of maintaining communication with the deceased. And if we think of one of the main tiers of African indigenous religions as being ancestral veneration, that aspect has got to continue in order for Islam to, con to, to take deep roots. And this is what we can see here. And it's also indicative of syncretism again and as symbols of status. The taller your pillar, the more status you've got. And they were used as places of veneration, these niches that you've got here. They would have had, for example, incense left in them or offerings or something like that. So you would go back and venerate your ancestors through leaving offerings in these tombs. Now, the background to them, again, they might be linked in with pre-Islamic megalithic traditions. It's unclear. There's a slight gap in the chronology there. But they do form part of a range of sites that are incorporated as a foci of devotion until recently in Swahili practice, particularly baobab trees. You can see this one's over a mound. Below this is an archaeological site. And when you find a baobab tree on the East African coast, almost always it's connected with an archaeological site. And these become foci of devotion, as do the abandoned and settlements themselves. And this is something that Mark Horton and John Middleton have written about in this very engaging book, where they describe whereby this is dini or religion and mila custom that coexisted to reconcile Islam and indigenous beliefs. And this is part of different ways which power relations were played out with Islam adding new dimensions to practice. Linda Donnelly has shown, for example, how the Warangwana Swahili families, the aristocrats, they were the freeborn, they were the oldest and most respected urban families, and they, could, they emphasized or uh, facilitated their structures of power by controlling who could build what, where, and when. And this was power that was materially manifest 
by controlling social progression from who could move from, for example, these sorts of poor quality houses you've got here into the coral house in the urban setting was controlled by the Warangwana as a way of maintaining their power structure. And the coral house, this was the, at the top of the hierarchy of architecture. It's indigenous in its materials, obviously. This is coral that's been cut wet from the sea, worked into blocks, and then hardens over time with a mangrove pole roof. Mangrove poles being cut from the swamps around. It's local materials, but very much an Islamized use of space being projected through the vertical axis, but also through the horizontal axis as well, as manifest in this ground plan. And this architectural form really did supplement Warangwana power and social mobility was only really manifest to women. Men were excluded from this as they could proceed through the various levels, women, through into the Indani, which you've got shown here, the harem at the deepest and darkest, the back end of the house. Archaeologically, Wynne Jones, Stephanie Wynne Jones and Jeff Fleischer's work at the uh, Rice University in Houston, their work at Songo Manar in Tanzania has indicated in an archaeological perspective the architectural articulation of power in the medieval Swahili world. Obviously, it's one way it's done is through the monumentality of mosques. This is their site as it's being excavated. This is a plan of their work that you can see here. And they've also argued convincingly that it was through the use of open spaces, how performances were enacted. We were hearing about that in one of the papers earlier on. How performances were enacted in open spaces as arenas for status-linked dances and processions. So an architecture of power that we have there. But what we don't want to do necessarily is overstate syncretic or blended practices. Elsewhere, we see the decline of pre-Islamic burial practices when people convert to Islam. And we see this in the inland Niger Delta area of Mali. Here's a satellite photograph. There's the Niger Delta area. There's the country of Mali. It's right in the heart of Mali. You can see this green block here from the satellite image. This is a close-up that I took uh, from the descent into Timbuktu on a plane that you can see there. And this is a vast alluvial plain of about 450 by about 220 kilometers that's annually inundated by the waters of the rivers Barney and Niger, hence the mechanism of transport that you've got there. And its fertility in an otherwise arid region means that this inland Niger Delta has been occupied since at least about 250 BC at, for example, the site of Jene Geno. There's the site plan there. And traditionally at Jene Geno, um, burial was via interment, as you can see here, in large urns. This is uh, quite a recognisable drawing style that I've abstracted from National Geographic, for those of you that are familiar with it. But you can see here this burial, this was the pre-Islamic burial method. And when conversion to Islam occurs at about 1400, you get the abandonment of that form of burial straight away. So in that urban setting, you get the abandonment of urn burial. You also get the abandonment of the site of Jene Geno that I just referred to because it was thought of as too painted, tainted with older indigenous religious practices, what used to be referred to as paganism, if we can put it like that. And you get the establishment of the neighboring city of Jene, represented here by the Jene Mosque, which many people think is a fabulous Sudanese example of Sudanese architecture, but it was actually designed by a French military officer at the beginning of the 20th century, incorporating elements from Dogon masks. He thought that's how this mosque in particular should look. So it's not the genuine article. But what the important point is you get the decline here of that, character, of, of that pre-Islamic practices there. And it reflects the Islamized character of Jene to this date, which is very much a center of scholarship in this region. And here, people were and are confident in their Islamic identity. However, you only need to go a short distance archaeologically away from Jene, and you get the traditions of urn burial persisting. People were buried in these large urns. There's two pots pushed together. It's been broken by an excavator. That's a bad bit of excavation going on there. It's chipped the corner off. But the people were placed in a contracted position. Can you see that? They'd have been placed down like that inside of it. And they often had grave goods placed in with them, like iron bracelets and ankle rings as well. Here, in the countryside... You get the persistence of these indigenous forms of burial, even after people in the town like Jene have converted to Islam. So here people were unwilling to shift their systems of belief. And that's one of the power of archaeology, is to show this variability uh, chronologically, if we can put it like that. 
So their ways of life were rooted in older sources of power. And this is also evident in the continued production of these beautiful anthropomorphic terracotta figurines that you can see here. And what's interesting is you actually get the expansion of the production of these figurative art forms after people have started to convert to Islam in the urban environments. So it's some sort of reaction to what's going on there. Here you can see, one again, one of these National Geographic stratigraphic profiles. But up here you've got one of the figurines. Here you've got another of the figurines. And people have argued that though they were reacting in some way to the presence of Islam in the region, they were also depicting possibly parts of Muslim prayer postures. Now, I'm not a specialist in that, but possibly that's what's going on. Certainly what seems to be going on here as well is you've got the representation of disease. These are like boils that may be related to the plague or some sort of skin condition in the hope that that would act as a scapegoat, that the disease would go to that rather than to the individual uh, you know, who, who owned or venerated that particular figurine. And the um, figurines have been interpreted by the excavators, Rod and Susan McIntosh, again of Rice University, as ritual directed towards ancestral worship. Here you've got one of these figurines that might even represent one of the types of shrines. This is the shrine excavated by the Macintoshes. It's got a large snake, perhaps a python, either going in or out. Here you've got another of these diseased individuals. You can see the line of bumps up his spine there. Again, possibly indicating this scapegoating going on. People were unwilling to abandon these materials because they were seen as efficacious, effective power objects. And it's perhaps possible that newer Islamic alternatives were not so appealing. So they stayed with this older material culture. And this is far from a unique instance, I have to say. The work of the renowned and sadly late uh, historian of Islam, Nehemiah Levtsion, he indicated how long drawn out processes of Islamic conversion were in this region. That's the last book that he uh, co-edited there. But this book in particular is significantly important. And this holds implications for complexity and temporal temporality of how systems of power changed and altered. And you can see this through looking at the way the dating of gravestones, this is a gravestone in Gao that we recorded here, how they differ chronologically. Paolo Farias has shown, for example, how in the northern areas where the nomads lived, they were the first to be exposed to Islam through being guides for traders and such like. There you have the earlier stones. Second group, you get them in the urban centres. The urban populations were interacting with the traders. They converted to Islam. That's the second group. But the, old, the most recent stones are those in the areas where the agriculturalists, where the farmers lived. Those people making the figurines I referred to before. So south on the river Niger here. So we see a complexity in tombstone patterning. And this archaeological evidence reflects both syncretism and conversion processes. And syncretism, of course, I'm not a historian, but it's something that's repeatedly indicated in the historical sources. We see this in relation to the kingdom of Karnem, for instance, here, a east of Lake Chad there. Here, the ruler Hu or Hua, as I say here, converted to Islam in the mid-11th century. By the, mid, by the 13th century, Islam was recorded as being the majority religion in Karnem, and the uh, historian Makhrizi recounts how the ruler went on Hajj in the mid-13th century. But throughout this period, authority to rule also rested on the possession of one particular power object. So they weren't wholly converted. And this power object, the Mune, seems to have been possibly a statue of Amun, not necessarily in gold, that was obtained from Meroe in the Nilotic Sudan. And it was wrapped, it was wrapped up and carefully curated or looked after. In order to be the ruler, you had to have possession of this symbol of power. And we know it was wrapped because it was unwrapped by a later ruler, the ruler Dunama, in the later 13th century. And this is important because this was an action that was seemingly indicative of firmer Islamic identities and also breaking with syncretism because by unwrapping this artifact, if this is what it was, it's not that particular one, but it's thought it might be that, by unwrapping it, you're destroying its mystique, you're taking away its power and you're making an assertion about greater confidence in your Muslim identity. Though the tradition of possessing symbols of power, we heard about symbols of power earlier on, about flags and banners, this persisted. Here you can see one of the lesser rulers of Bornu on the other side of Lake Chad with the flags that represent his authority. He's also sitting on a leopard skin, which in itself is a very symbolically powerful animal in relation to authority in Africa, because its coat is thought to manifest night and day, the yellow and the black, the sun and the night. 
So this is thought then that the ruler was controlling somehow, had the power to control time, to control day and night, coming in from indigenous belief systems. And the pos we see this also archaeologically. This is a fantastic site that was excavated by a German team in the 1990s. And we see sim possible symbols of power that are prominent in this site of Derby Takushai. It possibly was a rich burial of a, a ruler of Katsina who wanted to be buried with his grave goods. The position seems to be an orthodox Islamic one, but of course, obviously the inclusion of the grave goods is indicating a, a certain degree of complexity. With these beautiful inscriptions that you can see here, this bowl, I am a bowl, I contained all ingredients and helpers which may obey any desires and wishes. The silversmith made me acquire a dress of beauty and a fresh decoration, of which the most appealing are my clothes from hand and man. That's what it says on that. And that, if you even think about the inscriptive, the epigraphic content, would feed in nicely to, you know, appropriating power objects too, within this newly Islamized framework as well. Today, you can see similar processes. This is the results of the, of the work that we've been doing for the last 10 years at shrines in northern Ghana, around number three on the map. There's Ghana, the map of Africa. This is Ghana. We're right up in the far north. And we've, in particular, been looking at the operation of the shrine that's hidden behind this grove of trees. It's an earth and ancestral shrine called the Yani Shrine. And it's perceived of as very powerful because only women can be un infertile in the thinking in this region. It can cure female infertility. Only women are witches in this region. It can also identify witches. And you can't turn that shrine to work for you for bad. It's a shrine that functions for good. If you try and appropriate it for evil purposes, it'll turn on you and destroy you. So that means it's become the focus of pilgrimage. And also, what you can do is you can buy the right, the franchise, like you buy the franchise of McDonald's, you can buy the franchise to operate this shrine elsewhere. So we've been looking at this. This is the inside of the shrine. Above the, this is the earth priest. Above him is the medicine. It's made of a, a nut from a tree that's called a shear tree. They grind the oil out of that, and then they put herbs in it, and that's rubbed on the chest. In front of him is a massive mound of the sacrificial materials. You sacrifice fowls or dogs in the shrine, and then you leave the residues in there to show that it's accepted. And then behind, you've got the, uh, the uh, possessions of past earth priests, because they're sanctified by being associated with him. You're thinking, what's this got to do with power in Islam? Well, some of the main clients that go there are Muslims. Moshi Hauser de Gomba. You can see a gentleman here that we photographed. They go there as pilgrims, but they also go there and buy this franchise right for this shrine and take it away elsewhere as well. This is the medicine that comes with the franchise shrine. You can see this gentleman holding it in his hand. And it's franchised through these portable shrine forms. This is the Boabi, which translates as the shrine's child. You buy the child of the shrine. This is the Boachi, which is a lot more expensive because it gives you certain other obligations and rights as well. <clears throat> And like that Mooney I talked about before from Karnem, they're also wrapped. They're wrapped in the remains of the animals that have been sacrificed to them. You put the visible sacrificial elements on, like the skull, so people can recognize, oh, that's, a, that's had a cow, or that's had a sheep, or that's had a dog. It's a recognizable faunal element. And they build up bigger and bigger. I've seen, whoops, I've seen bar beads that get to about this high or thereabouts. So really powerful shrines indeed. And the medicine that empowers them is wrapped inside of it in a cow's horn in both. And people buy the agency in order to be able to use these elsewhere. So it gives power to the holder, but it also generates wealth, because people will be continually coming to you with their problems, giving you offerings, giving you money, in order that you can operate your shrine for them. So what essentially it does, it reflects when purchased by Muslims, as I say there, indigenous medicine... It also reflects sacrifice, and ultimately we could argue it reflects the incorporation of indigenous religion via the appropriation of that shrine in Islamic context. My work's funded by the Wellcome Trust, which is a major medical research charity in relation to this. And we've been trying to get insights into this with the Ghanaian diaspora, Muslim diaspora in London, to look at where they're being appropriate. I expect in New York there may even be one of the, or two of these shrines pumping away somewhere near here giving out their eff efficacious power. And we could say it's very much a belt and braces approach to power. It's integrating the two. And again, it indicates how power objects can be exchanged and recontextualized. And if you're interested, this book, Temporalizing, and there's another advert, sorry, but it's just come out, so uh, you know, I'd like people to buy it. That's all about these sorts of processes. It's 10 years' worth of work in it. 
Anyway, also evident is um, the utilization of the power of the word. We've been hearing about this, of course, in many instances. I'm not a specialist in this, but I've just had a PhD student complete a fantastic thesis look at, called The Healer's Tools. He's been looking at the Leoi, the wrapped leather inside here. You have a piece of the Quran inside these uh, leather amulets that you can see here. He's been looking at how those are created and used in the capital of Ghana, Accra, amongst Hausa, Hausa from northern Nigeria, a long way away, how they're using them and trading in those across the vast spaces of um, West Africa. And what you find essentially is the prophylactic powers, the protective powers are drawn upon, but they're also objects used to accumulate wealth and power. So they serve power purposes in different ways. Now, unfortunately, these organic materials, I've never found them archaeologically, you wouldn't find them, but this is a small metal case, a copper box, that we got from our excavations in Gao, dating from the 15th to 16th centuries. When the um, conservator cleaned it for us, she found inside traces of fibrous material that she argued were paper residues. So we don't know for sure, we haven't got the script on it, but it's as close as I've ever seen to finding one of these amulet cases in the archaeological record, so it has potential there. We also see the power of the word, and we, again, we've heard a lot about this in tombstones, and uh, uh, Colin Flight's work at Gaussani, a cemetery five kilometers north of that city of Gao I referred to earlier. He's looked at the Almeria. They're from Almeria on the Spanish coast. They were traded by the Almoravids in the 12th century, ready carved. You know, the marble is recognizably from that area. The geological provenance shows it so. But Flight interpreted how they also functioned as a sign of piety. This was a relationship of equality. This was a relationship whereby these stones were imported as these people had newly converted to Islam, as indicated by the sequence of the names on the three stones. The Prophet Muhammad and then the first two caliphs, Abu Bakr and Umar, are there. So it seems to me that Colin Flight's interpretation would be correct. And it's a relationship of equality um, which is being shown there. The power of the word was also evident in the Esuk example I showed before. And it's apparent in a whole range of other material culture from sub-Saharan Africa. This beautiful gown that would be worn underneath one of those, you may have seen long West, you see them in New York, long Sinhalese people wearing them, those long woolen robes. Underneath there with a calligraphic formula on it to protect you like an undergarment of power. Or here you've got also the Quran um, boards. These would be uh, written on in ink, as you can see there, and then it's washed off the ink and collected in a receptacle. And you drink the ink, and it's, of course, empowering you with the word. So this is something that's repeatedly done. One of my close workers in northern Ghana, he specializes in doing this, the preparation of these drinking medicines. So he built up quite a collection of these. Um, buried charm pots is another one. Again, archaeologically, we found, unfortunately, undated in Gao, deep down in the stratigraphy, a clay pot with an inscription of verse, or part of the Quranic verse around it that have been buried right down to protect the threshold of the house. So, you know, it's got that element too. We've also seen power relations, construction, legitimation and appropriation played out through commodities and their values. And again, we heard about commodities in relation to coinage earlier on. This reflects patterns of Africa trade, which is largely one of commodities for finished goods, as it is today. Um, the values varied. Gold, for example, we know it was the prop to power for Mansa Musa. This is Mansa Musa, the ruler of the Empire of Mali, the, one of the most fantastic medieval, we I'm misusing the term medieval, but I'm using it, medieval West African kingdoms. And he lived between about 1280 to 1327. Here he's holding his nugget of gold, showing his power in that map that was um, done by Crest produced in 1325-1327. Important also for our purposes behind him is Gagao, which is a reference probably, almost certainly, to Gao, that city that I was talking about. And in front of him, you've got one of these Tuaregs, the Berber inhabitants of the desert, who interestingly reverse normal Islamic practice by veiling the men's faces rather than the women, which is intriguing. Anyway, <clears throat> Mansa Musa is, of course, very famous and was projected into world history by his Hajj, his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324-25. It's a rather romantic illustration, admittedly. Not mine. I just snatched it off the internet. Um, but you can see that he was preceded. There are 8,000 people, according to the testimony, in his caravan. He was preceded by 500 slaves, apparently, each carrying a staff of gold, as well as having 80 camel loads of gold of 300 pounds weight each. The effect was so substantial that apparently he devalued the gold standard in Cairo, according to Alamari, for 20 years or something like that after their visit they spent so prodigiously. But this raises a question of how much was it valued, how much was gold valued in the desert edge cities of the Western Sahel, so down here. It's often said that it wasn't valued that people didn't value gold there. They valued copper. That's been referred to as the red gold of Africa in a book by Eugenia 
Herbert at Wesleyan College, or that power was based on, for example, ivory or exotica to them, like glass beads or cowrie shells. However, it seems now that gold was valued, that it was a much more complex pattern. Again, Sam Nixon's excavations in Essouk have turned up for the first time gold uh, coin mint moulds, that's the term I want, you can see here, 850 to 980, so that this is the first evidence we have for the minting of coins south of the Sahara that I'm aware of in this period. And it's indicating that gold dinars were being minted south of the Sahara, not only north, as previously so showed. There's his deep excavation there. And then again, you've got a plan of the site there as well. And this it begins to amplify our understanding of previous gold finds, which are very limited, because gold is obviously a material of enduring value and easy to recycle. Our very large-scale excavations in Gao only turned up that, that tiny bead, that scales in millimetres. So you get an idea of the size. It's very small indeed. The, dated to the 11th century, and the source analysis that was completed, we did um, laser ablation analysis, spectrographic analysis, and compared the composition of that with gold from West African sources. We know the gold came from here, the Serba Valley in Niger, and there's Gao there. But it also compositionally matched the gold that was being used for Almoravid dinars that were being minted up here as well. The technology, originally we thought that this was something that couldn't have been produced in West Africa because it's being made by a technique called gra granulation, where you fuse together small pieces of gold. It would now seem, based on these results, that we were wrong, that there's no reason why they couldn't have been making these complex materials south of the Sahara as well. So it's a changing picture with regard, and that would suggest that there was a market for gold there, and gold ornaments in particular, so concepts of value. Elsewhere, we know gold was much less valuable. Got, um, a value systems were placed on other commodities. We shouldn't refer to slaves as a commodity, but that is what a dehumanized person is. They are rendered a commodity. This is a pit from Gao that is full of the remains, probably, of slaves. These are people who are not being treated with respect. They've been slung into this pit like rubbish. Can you see that? They're all disarticulated and thrown around like that. They might be the residue of slaves that, was obvious, that we know were something of value there for internal systems and also for Islamic slave systems as well. Alternative hypothesis is these represent victims of disease that you equally might want to get off quite quickly, get rid of quite quickly. Other commodities that were important in different spheres of value, glass beads, you can see some here, and also cowrie shells. This is an amazing find from Kissi, the cemetery of Kissi and Burkina Faso. You can see the cowries in situ. This person was wearing a, a cowrie studded headdress, and that survived with the position of the cowrie shells there. These were imported from the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean. So, you know, this is showing you the value systems that were in operation in the first millennium AD. So, you know, Africa, a complex and powerful place. Um, emphasis we see also placed in, on particular colours of beads. The site of Ibo Aku, a fantastic site in southeastern Nigeria. It's not on the map here. But it's here. We looked at the beads from here. I worked with the excavator of it, Thurston Shaw, before he died. And they particularly wanted blue beads. You can see the reconstruction of the ruler being buried here. He's being walled in with these wooden planks there. And blue beads were what they sought. And this is the site which, of course, produced all these fantastic lost wax bronzes. This is skeuomorphic of a pot surrounded by a rope work. Uh, outer container to protect the pot itself that they've rendered in bronze there. Fantastic and indigenous technology, I hasten to add as well. Now, that's not an Islamic site, obviously. You can clearly see that. But it was connected to Gao, and our hypothesis is that this was the source of the elephant ivory, or one of the sources that was being traded up the River Niger. Not directly, but indirectly in the late first millennium AD, showing, again, the interconnection of different systems of value in operation. Finally, there is still so much research to do. Where I would really like to work, but security conditions don't permit it at the moment, is in the Republic of Chad, in the heart of Africa. This is a very important place. There's been almost no work. You can see that cover. It's a beautiful book cover, very Tintin-esque, if you understand what I mean. Uh, this was by the Le Burps. It was published in the 1950s, but there's been really no work there in Chad since the 1970s. And this is a real problem, because this is at the epicenter of all the central Sudanic routes. We've got good work being done in southern Libya on the Garamantes and their connections, the pre-Islamic trade. We've got a gap here in this area. And this was the place where Karnem was, I referred to before, but also the Sultanate of Bergermi and the Kotoko city-states as well. So very important indeed. And it has implications for systems of authority and perceptions of power. 
Also should make the point that what's very good is increasingly relevant research is being done by Africans themselves, as it should be. All my work is done in partnership with African scholars. I co-partner, co-author with them, because that is what the future of scholarship should be. So, for example, we have Felix Charmi working on the Swahili city-states of East Africa. We've got Abu Bakr Sani Sul, who's a Hausa. He's working on um, his home area, southern Bauchi State, northern Nigeria. Mamadou Sisse, he's a Malian. He's working on Gao. And then down here, this lady, Intazar El Zain, who's working, doing fantastic work on with the veil here, who's working on uh, northern Sudanese Islamic archaeology. So in conclusion, um, I would suggest that an interdisciplinary approach is vital to reconstructing the multiple dimensions of power, authority, and their relationship with material culture in the archaeology of Islam in sub-Saharan Africa, and that this encompassed varied dimensions that own, are not only related to objects, but are related to architecture, that are related to substances, to commodities, and less tangibly, to ideas and processes. So thank you for the invitation, and thank you for listening. <clears throat> It's so wonderful that it really shows the idea that there's just 
raw materials going yeah. more, um, and that, that you know, there's nothing of particular value being yeah. brought back to <laughs> the other side yeah. of the Sahara. It yeah. shows so clearly yeah. that there's a trade going in both directions. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Yes. Uh, yeah. Where do they get the gold from? Uh, there were various sources there. The one that we found is in Niger, the Sulaba Valley. There's also there's um, a further resources in Western Mali that are being exploited now by Anglo-Americans. And then there's a, a further one in the um, Akan region of the forest of Ghana, Kumasi area. So is, it, is it in the water or otherwise? In where, sorry? Well, is it in water or is it... Uh, oh, no, no, no. It's some shallow surface workings. So what they do is they follow the seams that contain the gold. Uh, there is it, they've only started doing deep shaft mining with modern with modern machinery. Uh, what would it be? You know, three to five meters below the ground, they can extract it out of that. It's dangerous work, but um, people are beginning to map also the archaeology. The mining companies are paying for archaeologists to go in advance and digging get more of it up to actually record some of these, which is quite good. a little bit more about the celadon top yeah. of the pillars. It's such an intriguing thing. Why did they do that? Do we have any idea? Um, well, I did my undergraduate dissertation on this uh, Chinese porcelain, so I can bore you about it. <laughs> Chinese porcelains of the East African coast. They weren't at the top. What they do is they tended to be set at about head height or thereabouts. Okay. And they were placed in it as a way of showing, I think, that these were luxury items that are being reconsumed and configured in new ways. That's the initial way that they were used. Because they were importing porcelain from, from China in great quantities. In particular, the green or the blue, if we could call it blue. There's something about blue in relation to blue glass beads and blue ceramics that they wanted. And uh, then later, I should, maybe should have made that point clearer, that the Swahili, up in, you know, when Pierce is writing in the late 19th century and Ingrams is writing, in the early 20th century. People are removing these bowls out and then beginning to use them in a wholly new way because they're thought of as old and powerful and grinding them up and putting them in medicine. And by medicine, I mean, you know, it could be a drinking medicine or a herbal medicine or something like that, and then consuming it to get the power of the old thing inside you. Yeah. you see? So it's a, it's a different system. Right. Yeah. You know the dates for those bowls? Yes, uh, they're largely between the 13th to 15th centuries with like Celadon. Then you get the appearance of blue and white like in the 15th through to about the 17th century. Mm -hmm. uh, the question you mentioned, uh, uh, the figure of Amun that was wrapped yeah. and that it was connected to Melody. Uh, but I assume that I've never seen it. No. Uh, so why is this very uh, it, speculative thing? It's a America? speculative thing, but it's not me speculating on that. It's um, H.R. Palmer, in, who was a British colonial administrator. Um, he was responsible for northern Nigeria territories, and then he went to the Gambia afterwards. In his Sudanese Chronicles, um, where he also puts in a lot of the historical sources from that region, there's a footnote in there that refers to this as being, I don't know where he got his information from, but the proximity of Meroe is actually quite close. It's the direct route from, if you went from Hauserland to, um, uh, from Karnan rather, across, it's in the of Karnan, you're on the right side of the Lake Chad, you'll hit the Nile about there. And of course there was intercourse across that region, again across Chad, that we would like to know more about. So I think that it, it, we don't know, it's speculative, but that seems to have been the appropriation of this god figure that may have been known of as powerful, but by Chinese whispers, had become un misunderstood as to what it was, and then reincorporated. And certainly the way it was treated, that wrapping is something recurrently you find in Africa as a way of concealing and containing power objects. The Met has quite a few also mm -hmm. um, natural history museum and these sorts of Well, what we have is our short uh, show which are representations of the pharaohs, but they have nothing to do with the Amun god. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there are many of those that, that you can find inside the graves, and they're yeah. excavated. But no, this was, seems, this was apparently, from what he says, it was something much more powerful. There was this statue that was... Yeah, that's, that's curious, because we, yeah. you, don't, you don't really see that in there. No, no. But that's what his footnote refers to, so I'm just referring to his work there. Yeah. 